Madam Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass House Resolution 265 as amended. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Resolution 265, Resolution Honoring Military Children During National Month of the Military Child. Pursuant to the rule, the gentlewoman from Guam, Ms. Bordallo, and the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Guam. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume and ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks under the resolution under consideration. Without objection. Madam Speaker, I stand before you in support of House Resolution 265, honoring military children for their personal sacrifice and recognizing the month of April as the National Month of the Military Child. Currently, 2.75 million Americans are serving in the armed forces of the United States. 1.7 million of these Americans who have served or are who currently serving have been deployed. Nearly 600,000 members have deployed more than once, and close to 260,000 are currently deployed. These are important points for us to take note of and reflect upon today, because today there are nearly 1.2 million military children in families whose parents proudly serve in the uniform. Unfortunately, 50% of the service members who are currently deployed away from their duty stations are separated from their spouses and their children. Long-term and multiple deployments have shown undesirable effects upon both service members their families, and their children. They sometimes experience severe emotional, psychological, and fiscal problems over the course of these deployments. Over extended periods of time, anxiety and strain become a part of the daily lives of both spouses and children who sacrifice unduly. Approximately three 3,400 military children have lost a parent serving in the armed forces during the preceding five years. Military children are making personal sacrifices in support of this nation. During National Month of the Military Child, we need to ensure that we support all the American children who faithfully share their family in order to protect our way of life. House Resolution 265 encourages public and private sector support for both military children and their families through direct contributions to scholarships, grants, and donations, action which promotes family readiness. So it is appropriate to celebrate the children who are loved by these brave men and women in uniform. The health and the well-being of these children is important to the overall readiness of our forces. We therefore appreciate the leadership shown by our distinguished colleague from Northern Virginia, Mr. Moran, in sponsoring this important resolution. Madam Speaker, I urge my colleagues to support House Resolution 265, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume. Without objection. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise in strong support of House Resolution 265 as amended, which honors military children during National Month of the Military Child. Today, we are a nation at war with more than 2.75 million men and women in uniform and more than 280,000 deployed worldwide. The men and women of today's armed forces are all volunteers, but as never before in our history, they are also married and have families. At any given time, when deployed away from their home bases, 50% of the members of the armed forces leave behind families with children. While the numbers and statistics are interesting, the real message here is that the sacrifices and commitments made by the members of the armed services are very often directly felt and experienced by their family members and especially their children. Each of the military services and the Department of Defense go to extraordinary lengths to provide the resources and environment to support military families and children. Preservation and support of families 
is recognized as a military readiness requirement. I fully support those efforts. The resolution today strives to ensure that proper attention is focused on the sacrifices, spirit, and contributions made by the children of military families. This resolution also seeks to bring recognition and thanks to both the Department of Defense and private sector programs that support military children and families. Mr. Sp M Madam Speaker, I want to thank my friend Mr. Moran of Virginia for sponsoring this important resolution and urge my colleagues to support it. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Guam is recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I uh, yield such time as he may consume to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran, who is the original sponsor of this important measure. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for such time as he may consume. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I uh, thank my uh, uh, friend, the uh, distinguished delegate from the Virgin Islands, for, uh, from Guam, I mean, excuse me, from Guam, uh, for yielding me the time and uh, appreciate her service. And uh, I, th I thank the gentleman from uh, Virginia for his kind comments as well, Mr. Whitman. Um, and I'm glad to be joined here by uh, the Chair of Military uh, Construction Quality of Life Appropriations uh, Subcommittee, uh, Mr. Chet Edwards, as well as Sanford Bishop uh, on the uh, Defense Appropriations. And are you on Quality of Life, too, Sanford? And on, I'm not surprised uh, on the Military Construction Quality of Life Appropriations Subcommittee. Um, Madam Speaker, growing up is difficult. But imagine what it must be like when one parent, or even both parents, are deployed abroad as part of their duty in our armed forces. While friends and relatives pray for their safe return, no one feels the impact of deployment more than the children of service members in combat overseas. We are learning more about the impact that living under this shadow of uncertainty has on our children. The incidence of military children needing psychological counseling has increased dramatically. Last year, Children's Hospital in the District of Columbia had over a thousand visits from military children suffering from behavioral and mental health problems. These are just normal kids who want what any child wants. Their mothers or fathers at home to tuck them in at night, reassuring them that all will be all right. Today, more than 2,300,000 Americans demonstrate their courage and commitment every day to our nation by serving in our armed forces. And of these men and women, most have families subjected to frequent moves from one installation to another, long deployments abroad, and the fear that their loved one serving overseas might never come home. Fifty percent of our troops deployed overseas have children that are left behind. That's more than a million children with at least one parent deployed overseas. Those figures, statistics, can too easily be ignored sometimes because they're abstract. But here's one that can't be dismissed. 3,400 children have already lost a parent serving in the armed forces over the past six years. When I introduced this resolution two years ago, the number of children who'd lost a parent was 1,000, and now it's 3,400. The Department of Defense understands that without the family support, they'll never get the soldiers' full support. In 1986, Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger declared this month the National Month of the Military Child, and every year since, Events at military bases, forts, and other installations across the nation have been held to celebrate the military family, replete with lots of lofty rhetoric, but not enough true attention to their needs. Two bases in my own district, Fort Belvoir and Fort Myer, hold annual events providing military kids the chance to be distracted a bit by just being a kid with other kids in similar situations. But the Congress needs to step up. 
Today, I'm glad to join with my colleagues, particularly with my colleagues who will speak here today, to offer this resolution officially recognizing this month of April as the National Month of the Military Child and dedicating the Congress to paying more attention to the children and the spouses of our soldiers. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle, Representatives Issa and Walter Jones in North Carolina, are bipartisan sponsors and steady advocates for this effort. I thank them for their support and leadership. This resolution is just a small way that Congress can recognize the sacrifice these youngsters and their families are asked to make, but it is an opportunity to commit ourselves to doing much more. Specifically, the resolution joins the Secretary of Defense in honoring military children, recognizing that they, they too share the burden and are making a great sacrifice in protecting our nation. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the organization Kids Serve Too. It's in my congressional district. It's dedicated to the needs of military families everywhere. It was created by military families to support other military families. Kids Serve Too sponsors activities and events for military children. It's represented in the gallery today specifically by Tricia Johnson, her daughters, Kat and Claire, and her sister, Kathleen Murphy. Madam Speaker, military families and their children deserve our heartfelt appreciation for their sacrifice. Today, we honor them and their sacrifice, and thank you for bringing this resolution to the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members are not permitted to recognize guests in the... Uh, I appreciate the admonition, Madam Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, I will reserve uh, the, the uh, 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 Madam Carvalho will reserve the balance of our time. We've got uh, two more speakers. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from, gentlewoman from Guam is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield two minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Edwards, the chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Military Construction. I thank the gentleman the is recognized for her, her time and recognition. Uh, Madam Speaker, I want to salute uh, Mr. Moran and the co-sponsors of this resolution. Uh, in my book, military children and spouses are truly the unsung heroes and heroines of our nation's defense. They may not put on our nation's uniform, but they serve every single day, and they serve with great honor and distinction. One that could not have a makeup day for a parent not being there for a birthday, for special occasions, for a mom or a dad not being there for a high school graduation or college graduation. There are no makeup days for those missed special occasions. And as Mr. Moran pointed out so poignantly, in 3,400 cases, military children have made the ultimate sacrifice of losing a mother or father in service to, to our country. It is so right that we honor these great Americans, the military children, today with, with this resolution. As Mr. Moran also pointed out, I think it's even more important that we honor them not just during the month of April with our words and four speeches, but every day and every month and every year with our deeds. With effective funding, adequate funding for the impact aid program that provides extra federal funding to school districts with heavy concentrations of military children, with daycare programs, which this Congress last year took the initiative on and added $130 million worth of daycare centers for military children throughout the country, especially needed during a time of, of, of war. Uh, we worked hard on military housing so that children can live in in houses they're proud to, to call their homes and their parents as, as well. And this Congress last year took the initiative in increasing by a historic unprecedented level funding for VA medical care so that when those parents leave the military, they will continue to get their medical care. I urge support of this resolution. The gentleman has no time to yield. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If Ms. Verdalio has no more speakers, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Guam is recognized. The gentlewoman from Guam is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Where's my card? Okay. 
The question is, will the House suspend the rules and agree to House Resolution 265 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The resolution is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Guam rise? Madam Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass House Joint Resolution 70 as amended. The clerk will report the title of the joint resolution. House Joint Resolution 70, Joint Resolution Congratulating the Army Reserve on its centennial, which will be formally celebrated on April 23, 2008, and commemorating the historic contributions of its veterans and continuing contributions of its soldiers to the vital national security interest and homeland defense missions of the United States. Pursuant to the rule, the gentlewoman from Guam, Ms. Bordallo, and the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Guam. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume, and I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks on the resolution now under consideration. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise today in support of House Joint Resolution 70, which commemorates 2008 as the centennial of the United States Army Reserve. Celebrating the historic contributions of its veterans and continuing con contributions of its soldiers to operations at home and abroad. I thank my colleague, Mr. Bishop of Georgia, for introducing this important resolution. On January 9, 1905, the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, dispatched a special message to the Senate and House of Representatives recommending passage of legislation to establish a Federal Reserve Force of trained personnel to bring our Army to its highest point of efficiency. Beginning as a supplementary unit at the turn of the 20th century, our Army Reserve soldiers have shown immeasurable dedication and valor through the broadening of their inceptive purpose. The Army Reserve has developed from a few support troops during World War I into a vital and sustained operational force for current and future operations. This federal force has been deployed in different capacities, serving in eight wars and defending the interests of the United States and its allies in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Russia, Berlin, Panama, the Persian Gulf, Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, Kenya, Iraq, and numerous humanitarian missions in other countries during its first 100 years. Involvement in operations Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Joint Endeavor, Joint Guard, Enduring Freedom, Noble Eagle, and Iraqi Freedom shows the Army is incomplete without the skilled and trained personnel of its reserve. The Army Reserve has grown from 160 medical officers to virtually 200,000 soldiers who play a major role in the defense of our nation and who continue in the furtherance of the United States defense interests. At this moment, approximately 50,000 of our nation's Army Reserve soldiers are serving on active duty around the world. These men and women voluntarily put their civilian careers and family lives on hold, and in most cases, they do so for over a year, which is a testament to their selflessness, patriotism, and willingness to sacrifice for the good of our country. Indeed, I'm extremely proud of all our armed forces, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, and the National Guard. Our entire military continues to work diligently in a time of conflict and deserves the highest respect for their courage in the face of adversity. House Joint Resolution 70 is our way, as the United States Congress, of recognizing the centennial of our Army Reserve, a force that our institution played a role in creating a hundred years ago. This resolution honors the sacrifice and tremendous 
distinction of the millions of American men and women who have served as Army soldiers since April 23, 1908. Madam Speaker, I again thank our colleague from Georgia, Mr. Bishop, for his initiative in bringing us together today to recognize and honor the Army Reserve on the occasion of its 100th anniversary. And I urge my colleagues to support this resolution. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise in strong support of House Joint Resolution 70 as amended, which congratulates the Army Reserve on its centennial. There are over 340 Army Reservists in Virginia's 1st District, and over 150 have been mobilized in support of the global war on terror. Ever since 1908, when the Army Reserve began as a means to increase the efficiency of the Army Medical Corps, the Army Reserve and its soldiers have stepped up magnificently to every challenge and mission presented to them. Those challenges span the breadth of the American wars in the past 100 years. In World War I, 169,500 Army Reservists served. In World War II, 200,000, including 29% of the Army's officer corps. In Korea, 240,500. In Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, 94,000. And since September 11, 2001, 147,000 Army Reservists have been mobilized in support of the global war on terror. 110,000 have deployed, 39,000 have served multiple deployments, and 102 have died in the war on terror. Army Reservists are citizen soldiers active in more than 100, excuse me, 1,100 communities across the nation. They are the sons and daughters, mothers and fathers of America. They are remarkable in many respects, but no more so than their willingness to serve this nation in a professional and unselfish manner. They continue to serve today knowing that they will likely be deployed away from home, family, and civilian employment. For many in America, the patriotism, commitment, and sacrifice of these remarkable citizens called Army Reservists goes unnoticed. I believe every effort should be made to highlight and acknowledge their service to a grateful nation. So it is entirely proper and fitting that we take this moment not only to mark a historical milestone of 100 years of service to the nation by the Army Reserve, but also to honor those soldiers, past and present, who have served and are serving so honorably as well as Army Reservists. Madam Speaker, I strongly urge my colleagues to support this joint resolution, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Guam is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield five minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Bishop, the original sponsor of this joint resolution. The gentleman is recognized. I thank the gentlelady from, for yielding, Madam Speaker. I'm honored to sponsor this bipartisan resolution, along with Representatives Byer, Shimkus, and Taylor, uh, to congratulate the United States Army Reserve on its 100th anniversary, which will be formally celebrated on April 23, 2008. The resolution, which has 260 co-sponsors, also commemorates the contributions of Army Reserve veterans who have helped to ensure that the United States' vital national security interests are protected and defended in times of war and peace. I'm very grateful by the outpouring of bipartisan support that this resolution has received. It's indicative of the high regard and esteem in which the Army Reserve is held among members of Congress and the American people. As a current member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense, as well as the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Subcommittee, I've been extremely impressed by the level of commitment that Army Reserve soldiers bring to their work and by their high degree of professionalism. They truly are twice the citizen, as Winston Churchill once remarked. 
Today, the U.S. Army Reserve is composed of more than 30,000 officers and 150,000 enlisted soldiers. They have an active presence in 1,100 communities across our nation, contributing military values, important job skills, and economic support. They are husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters. They are our neighbors, our friends, our acquaintances, and our colleagues at work. These soldiers can be called up at any time to serve our nation, and they must be trained and prepared to respond at a moment's notice. Here in the House of Representatives, 24 members, including myself, have been privileged to serve in the reserves. In fact, two of the lead sponsors of this resolution, Res uh, Representative Steve Boyer and John Shimka, still serve in the Army Reserve. As this resolution notes, the role of today's Army Reserve soldier has expanded and changed dramatically uh, since President Roosevelt first requested that Congress establish a reserve of trained officers. On April 23, 1908, Congress responded to the President's request by establishing a permanent reserve corps of trained medical officers. The modest corps represented the humble start of what is today a multifaceted operational and strategic force. Since then, their duties have expanded. The Army Reserve is now an integral component in any active U.S. Army mission. They have answered the call of duty in World Wars I and II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War, Panama, the Gulf War, Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, and of course, since September 11, 2001, in Operation Noble, Evil, Noble Eagle, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation Enduring Freedom. Through October 31, 2007, 102 Army Reserve soldiers made the ultimate sacrifice while serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. Since then, an additional four Reserve officers have lost their lives in combat. We dedicate this resolution to their memory and to the memory of all Reserve soldiers who fought and died defending our nation's freedoms throughout our history. We dedicate this resolution to our living heroes as well, to those men and women who continue their service to our nation in the U.S. Army Reserve today. I want to commend several staff members for their outstanding work in bringing this resolution to the floor. Kevin Coughlin, Joe Hicken, and John Chapla on the House Armed Services Committee, Tim Welter and Abel Carrero on Congressman Boyer's staff, Grant Culp, Congressman Shimkus' staff, Randy Jennings on Congressman Taylor's staff, David Whitney on the House Judiciary Committee, Lieutenant General Jack C. Stoltz, and Lieutenant Colonel Rob Young of the Army Reserve, and Jonathan Halpern and Ed Larkin on my staff. Madam Speaker, I again thank my colleagues who are co-sponsors for their extraordinary support of this resolution, and I urge its immediate adoption. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Madam Speaker, if Ms. Bordalio has no more speakers, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Guam. Madam Speaker, at this time I have no further requests for time and I yield back the balance of my time. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and agree to House Joint Resolution 70 as amended? Those in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the resolution is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Guam rise? The gentlewoman from Guam is recognized. Madam Speaker, uh, I'd like to request the yeas and the nays on the previous resolution. Is there any objection to the yeas and nays being ordered in this, on that particular joint resolution 70? By unanimous consent, the yeas and nays have been requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will remain, rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient number having risen, 
The yeas and nays are ordered pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20 in the Chair's prior announcement. Further proceedings on this motion will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Guam rise? Madam Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass House Resolution 1020 as amended. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Resolution 1020, resolution recognizing the tremendous service that members of the armed forces have given to the nation, especially those who have been wounded in combat. Pursuant to the rule, the gentlewoman from Guam, Ms. Bordallo, and the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Wood, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Guam. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume and ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks on the resolution now under consideration. Without objection. Madam Speaker, I rise today in support of House Resolution 1020, recognizing the tremendous service that members of our armed forces have provided to the country especially those who have been wounded in combat. I thank our colleague from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for introducing this resolution. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and their families are making extraordinary sacrifices in service to our country. Over 4,500 service members have made the ultimate sacrifice in Operations Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. Nearly 32,000 service members have been wounded, of which a little over 17,000 have returned to duty. Today, service members have an unprecedented chance of survival, unlike those who had similar wounds in Vietnam in the Second World War. The medical advances that have taken place on the current battlefield have made these significant achievements possible. However, while members are surviving their injuries and wounds at an unprecedented rate, they are coming home with more complex psychological injuries. These individuals who have honorably served our nation may need medical care and assistance for the rest of their lives. House Resolution 1020 commits this Congress to ensuring that these brave wounded warriors receive the best medical care available and commends all Americans who volunteer to support these wounded warriors and their families. So, Madam Speaker, I again commend our colleague from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for his introduction of this resolution, and I urge my colleagues to support its passage, and I reserve the balance of my time. Recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise in strong support of House Resolution 1020 as amended, which recognizes the tremendous service that members of the armed forces have given to the nation, especially those who have been wounded in combat. Madam Speaker, throughout our history, America's sons and daughters have been called upon to fight our nation's wars to preserve our freedom and our way of life. Each time we have gone to war, these brave men and women who answer the call, unfortunately, have been wounded and injured. 2004, excuse me, 200,004 and 2 in World War I, 671,846 in World War II, 103,284 in Korea, 153,303 in Vietnam, and 467 in Desert Storm. Today, Madam Speaker, as we continue to fight terrorism throughout the world, 30,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have been wounded and injured in Iraq and Afghanistan. As with previous generations, these men and women are our nation's finest, and we owe them more than just our gratitude. Madam Speaker, since the beginning of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Congress and the American people have made it clear that our combat wounded deserve the best our nation has to offer. To that end, Congress has worked hard to ensure that the needs of the wounded troops and their families are met. From the best health care, to jobs, to education benefits, the members of this House have and will continue to insist that the support to the wounded and injured 
is unsurpassed. Madam Speaker, there is no question that serving in combat is a profoundly life-altering experience. Men and women who survive the horrors of combat return home forever changed. Our nation is eternally indebted to the brave men and women of the armed forces who fight to preserve our freedoms. It is right and fitting, Madam Speaker, that today we recognize the service and the sacrifice of the members of the armed forces who have been wounded while serving this great nation. I'd like to thank my friend and colleague from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, for introducing this resolution, and I strongly urge all members to support this resolution. And Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Guam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield three minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins. The Thank you. From, uh, the gentleman from New York is recognized for three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank the sponsor of this uh, bill, uh, Mr. Welsh from Vermont. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of House Resolution 1020. Thanks to advances in modern technology, many American soldiers serving in Iraq and Afghanistan have lived through events that would have previously cost them their lives. Of the 1.6 million service members that have been deployed in Operation Enduring Freedom in Operation Iraqi Freedom since September 2001, more than 30,000 have been wounded in battle. The numbers are staggering, but we are here today to acknowledge that these wounded warriors are not just statistics. They are men and women from across the country who have faced unique situations and struggles, and they have individual stories to tell. Last summer, I had the honor to meet a young man from my district who was injured in a roadside bomb explosion in Iraq that killed three other soldiers riding in the same Humvee. He suffered extensive injuries, including a broken back and elbow, and underwent two surgeries at a hospital in Germany before being transferred to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Quick, quick reaction by the medics meant that instead of being paralyzed, he can now walk again but only after extensive surgeries and painful rehabilitation. This young man is actually a lucky one. He was able to recover with the help of a caring family and a supportive wife. There are many others that are not as fortunate, and it is our responsibility to provide them with the best physical and emotional support possible. Over the last year, Congress has taken many steps to enhance the quality of care of our veterans, including passing the largest increase in veterans' health funding in history. But there is still more to be done. With this legislation, we do a simple but necessary thing. We take a moment to thank the men and women of the armed services who have been wounded in the line of duty and for their service and their sacrifice. I urge my colleagues to support passage of House Resolution 1020. Thank you. Who seeks time? Gentleman from Virginia. Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Guam is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield two minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, the original sponsor of this very important resolution. The gentleman from Vermont is recognized uh, for two minutes. Thank you, I, Madam Speaker. I thank the, uh, the gentlewoman from Guam, my co-sponsor and traveling companion, the new member, distinguished member already from Virginia, my co-sponsors. You know, they've said it uh, pretty well. Uh, there's nothing that we can say or do that will acknowledge our appreciation for the sacrifice that the men and women of the uniformed services have given to this country. What we're acknowledging here is that we have a common commitment to meeting the needs of those soldiers and sailors and airmen who return from active duty. What we're also acknowledging is that in this war, very much unlike past conflicts, our soldiers benefiting from this extraordinary battlefield, battlefield medicine are returning with extraordinary injuries that is what they will have to live with for the rest of their lives. And many of us have had the opportunity to visit some of these soldiers out at Bethesda, out at Walter Reed. And we're trying in this small gesture to acknowledge the sense that all of us have in Congress of our debt and our obligation and our appreciation to them. And Madam Chair, next week, 
Madam Speaker, next week we're going to have a group of these servicemen and women visiting us in the Capitol, and I'm going to be joining with my colleagues here today to welcome those men and women of the uniformed services to this Capitol. And I'll encourage all of us to join in welcoming them personally to thank them for their sacrifice. And I yield back the balance of my time. Who seeks time? Gentleman from Virginia. Madam Speaker, I yield to Mr. Wahlberg, the gentleman from Michigan, as much time as he may consume. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for such much, as some such time as he may consume. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise uh, with my colleague from Vermont to voice strong support for HRS 1020, which expresses the commitment of this Congress to our injured heroes, ensures they're receiving the highest quality of health care available, and encourages all Americans to show support and appreciation for our veterans. Today, I want to take time and thank all the servicemen and women and their families for their sacrifices. I know the pride of having a son serve in the United States military, and my wife Sue and I pray every day for the safety of our fighting men and women abroad and here at home. When our soldiers go into battle, we can all agree that they deserve the best training, equipment, and necessary resources to accomplish their mission. Congress has an obligation to care for America's wounded heroes. When they return home from the battlefield, I believe the least we can do is to provide the highest quality medical care to the brave men and women of our armed forces when they're injured defending the freedoms that we enjoy. Right now we have more wounded warriors returning home than ever before because of improved medical technology and advanced equipment to transport our sick and wounded. The thousands of men and women serving in the military who have been wounded serving in Iraq and Afghanistan and other wars deserve the best treatment and care available. I look forward to working with my colleagues in a nonpartisan manner to make sure Congress delivers on our responsibility. I urge my colleagues to support HRES 1020 and support our wounded warriors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Guam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, I have no further requests for time. I am prepared to close after my colleague has yielded back his time. I continue to reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Virginia. Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Guam. Madam Speaker, at this time, I have no further speakers, and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. I would like to extend my sincerest thanks to my colleague uh, on the House Committee of Armed Services and Natural Resources, Mr. Whitman. I've enjoyed uh, working with him on the floor this afternoon. Is, will the House suspend the rules and agree to House Resolution 1020? As amended. As amended. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The resolution is agreed to. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table.